Good afternoon. I'm very sorry I can't attend this vestry meeting in person, but I will be joining you via Zoom. But out of an abundance of caution, I have pre-recorded my faith formation. The scripture that I have chosen for this faith formation is the fourth chapter of Esther. Now, let me put this in a personal context. This scripture has inspired and informed me throughout my life. I remember the first time it sort of hit me. I was in private practice, but I was also on a voluntary basis, the Associate General Counsel for the NAACP for North Carolina. We were involved in voting rights cases just after Thornburg v. Gingles had come from the Supreme Court. I was in a city where black people, the black community, was asked to silently bow to pay their taxes, even though they were 49.5% of the population, no African American had ever sat on a city council that was made up of eight people, and we had a city that tightly held to power, using all of its mechanisms to keep the status quo. I knew that this battle was going to change my life, my family's life, and my legal career forever, either for the good or the bad. So as the community discussed going out on a venture that ended up lasting five years, this scripture, the fourth chapter of Esther, came up. Before I read the passage that forms this lesson, let me contextualize it for you. Esther was from a humble Hebrew family. She had been raised by a relative, Mordecai. Now, Esther had gone through this contest and became the wife of the king of Persia, but she had hidden her Jewish heritage. Haman, the king's second-in-command, hated Mordecai because Mordecai would not bow down to Haman. He saw him for what Haman was. And so Haman then prepared a plan to commit what was, in essence, genocide for the, the Jewish people. Mordecai asked Esther to intervene and save her people. After all, she's queen. Esther sends back word that she must wait for the king to call her because she cannot come under penalty of death if she goes without him calling. This is an existential threat both to her and also to her people. So we come to the 12th verse, and it reads, When they told Mordecai, Esther's surrogate parent, what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think that in your king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Post-COVID, the world has changed, and we're beginning to see some existential threats to the church. Nationwide church attendance is down. If you look at the Episcopal Church at the national level and at the diocesan level, active baptized members down. Attendance is down. Now, donations actually have increased at the national and diocesan level. If we take a look at St. Ambrose, our active baptized membership has gone in the opposite direction. It's gone up. Our attendance, however, has gone down and our donations have fluctuated basically over a five-year trend, staying flat. All of these, at all levels, they have their ominous implications for us as a Christian community, calling on us, challenging us to lead. Esther, like the church today, has two choices, both carrying existential risk. The silent approach, business as usual, holding on to the past, waxing fondly about days gone by, hoping that this post-COVID change will pass over us. The technology, the attendance, the expectations of people will hopefully pass and we'll just survive in it. That approach has its risks. 
we also can take the position to walk out on our collective wisdom and faith, looking forward, trying to position St. Ambrose to speak old truths, still relevant to new generations and old generations, to generations that are facing new challenges in a world that seems new, yet when you boil it all down, isn't all that new. And so as I put this in our times, I go back to the verse with a slight modification and read, perhaps you have come to the vestry for just such a time as this. When I look at this vestry, I see a collective genius far beyond any obstacle that we have facing us. I see those who know the power of prayer as I realized it when my son was in the hospital and you, this vestry, reached out and prayed and prayed and buoyed our spirits. I know that we as a vestry can galvanize this congregation and position St. Ambrose for the next generation to come. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you recognizing your omnipotent hand in the creation of this historic Episcopal congregation. We gather for this vestry meeting and we humbly seek your guidance and your strength as we reflect upon leadership during a time of change. Lord, we acknowledge the rich history of this congregation woven with a tapestry of great leaders and saints who have gone before, but whose unwavering faith and dedication to your word paved the way for us to be here today. As we confront the challenges of change in the midst of this nation and the world, we pray for your wisdom and your guidance that you guide us as you guided those who went before us. Grant us the discernment to understand the needs of our congregation and our community and the courage to make the decisions that honor our heritage and direct our course in the way you would have it to go. Let us remain steadfast in promoting justice and equity and inclusivity in all that we do so that we may continue to be a beacon of hope and understanding in a world that sometimes closes its mind and divides. Help us to listen to those speaking and to speak honestly and act justly so that our leadership will continue to reflect the transformative power of your love. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer.